aspect is uh, an allergy uh, to local anesthetics. Some people have, and that's to the esters usually. Um, and that's because they're made with PAPA, the para amino benzoic acid. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think what else is there. Oh, another point about allergy. Patients say, oh, I'm allergic to, to local anesthetics because I got Novocaine in the dentist and I had this reaction. And the reaction is because they had tachycardia, probably because there was epinephrine involved. So mm -hmm. Novocaine that they used, and some of them they still use lidocaine with epinephrine and things. Um, very vascular areas here, it gets reabsorbed, and then they cause that, that reaction, but technically it's not an allergy. The other one is TNS. We get tested on some or transient neurologic symptoms. It tends to be after you know, a neuroaxial type procedure, uh, I mean an epidural spinal, you get this severe pain in the buttocks area, the lower back, mm -hmm. posterior thighs, but no weakness, just chronic, just more as pain. Um, attributed mainly to lidocaine is a big one that we're testing on for, because uh, it may have an inflammatory etiology for some reason. Uh, it usually starts a day after or so of the procedure, it can last for three to seven days, and it usually, usually resolves on its own and we can treat it with, with NSAIDs. Is that something you would see a lot for people who have kind of already sciatic pain and things like that? It could, could, I, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. Last two couple points uh, that we wanted to discuss today, enhanced recovery or ERAS. Mm -hmm. uh, what this thing is a big bundle of patient care. Uh, it's basically like 15 to 20 evidence-based protocols that, that help standardize it, increase patient uh, you know, thoughts and, and care for surgery after the perioperative period uh, and their outcomes as well and then lower health care costs. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michael Scott is our biggest champion here is what we hired him for not only for his everything else that he's done with us in critical care and everything but he is our ERAS champion. Uh, he's done a lot with ERAS within um, uh, over in, in, in the UK. It's a multidisciplinary approach you have a lot of individuals involved in this to help manage these uh, and ultimately the key principle behind it is to reduce the perioperative stress uh, promote stability and then restore function rapidly and get patients home quicker and safer. Part of that is multimodal analgesia from an anesthesia aspect. So how can we make that better? Well, we can prescribe these different medications to help with this or do regional nerve blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Tylenol, gabapentin, opioids, magnesium, ketamine, Presidex or dexmedetomidine, Ketorolac as an NSAID, uh, and then our regional nerve blocks. Right. Uh, last couple things, MPO. So we always talk about those, like when can patients safely go to surgery? So what, we, what we've always said is our um, policies here, but also recommended by the American Society of Anesthesiologists, patients can have clear liquids up to two hours prior to scheduled surgery. Um, breast milk, three to four hours. Uh, the reason I say that is ASA says four, and I think our policy here is three. Mm -hmm. It really digests pretty quickly. Infant formula though, definitely four hours. Uh, if you have a light meal, we always say six, so another need at least six hours in advance. But if somebody went and ate a Big Mac, <laughs> probably be a little careful, it may say eight hours. But um, one thing that we've done here is uh, Dr. Shah, uh, so Pranav Shah, and some of us with our um, point of care ultrasound, we're trying to advance that, which is a new technology that we're using a lot of, is uh, you can do a gastric ultrasound, actually see the stomach and see what's in there. So that also helps, you know, make, it sort of helps guide your decision making, right? Mm -hmm. Anesthesia is all at risk benefit, and so every patient's different. Mm -hmm. But these are guidelines, they're not strict rules. Right, and it depends on the surgery. Correct. Right. It depends on the surgery, and uh, you know, most of us would say though, like, there was one day a guy, he's coming to get hand surgery, and he uh, said, well, I had some coffee, and I'm like, would you have anything in coffee? Yeah, I put some powdered creamer in there. That's six hours right off the bat, most mm -hmm. of the time. And could we have done a point of care ultrasound, and he took it at three and a half, or 3 a.m., 4 a.m., you know, we, we could have. But we discussed it with the surgeon, and the surgeon said, nope, that's our rule. We're not going to follow it today. We have to reschedule. Mm -hmm. um, Pre-op medications, I usually like them at least 30 minutes, but preferably an hour before we go back. Um, and sometimes we'll give them and go, and that's okay, but you should know, take the risk. Usually less than about 30 ml of water. So a small cup of water, they can take their pre-op meds and are okay. And then women in labor can have clear liquids and jellos and things like that. It wouldn't be fair to starve them for 24 hours and they expect them after a 24 hour period of induction to say, hey, 
Now you got to push for two hours with no mm -hmm. energy, no carbohydrates, no supplies. And feed your baby. Yeah, and then feed your baby. <laughs> True. How does it change y'all's, um, for women that aren't in labor and that are pregnant yep. back there? Because obviously we've done surgeries on pregnant women. How does that change? What kind of monitoring do you, is done? Is like someone called in to do fetal heart tones or how does that work? Yeah, so that's a good question. So fetal heart monitoring, uh, usually if it's a viable pregnancy, uh, meaning greater than about 24 to 25 weeks, uh, obstetrics is already involved, and we'll base with them what do they feel. Uh, depending on the case, I may do fetal heart tone monitoring intraoperatively the entire time, because I know a little bit of hypotension is gonna decrease supply to the uterus, decrease supply to the placenta, and then the baby may have some bradycardia with it, so I have to make sure I keep my pressures normotensive. But uh, I did do a case where we did not, we did fetal heart tones before and after, Mm -hmm. And she did fine. Yeah. She had a lot of pain afterwards, and that you know we had to treat that aspect. But uh, for the baby, the baby did really well. So there's yeah. talking about a little bit about uh, recovery from anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, so the modified Aldred scale, looking at respirations, their oxygen saturations, consciousness, circulation, and airway or activity. I'm sorry. Uh, to sort of make sure they get these points. Usually, you get a score of ten. Greater than nine or so, we say, okay, I guess they're okay to go home. Uh, so every, every patient is different, though. That's mm -hmm. why I say, yes, we can say they go home, right? Because you got to tailor it. So, but majority of people will, will meet those will meet those criteria and say it's appropriate. And if not, we'll keep them here a little longer. <laughs> Some side effects of anesthesia. We talked about POMB. Uh, I always tell patients you may be a little drowsy or fussy, or especially kids fussy, a little dizzy sometimes. So you always got to have a driver. They have some myalgias or soreness, um, definitely a sore throat if they had a breathing device or a breathing tube. This general malaise and not feeling well, and then the impaired psychomotor cognitive skills uh, is a big portion as well. Discharge instructions, gotta have a driver. Uh, I wanna make sure they have appropriate POMV management and good pain relief. Uh, and either they have one of our peripheral nerve catheters, our APS teams are involved and they have their contact info we make sure the dressing's clean and appropriate, it's not bleeding or leaking. But what is it, six um, hours after general anesthesia? What is that parameter? No, 24 just, hours after 24 hours after general, general anesthesia. And to try? Yeah. Six yeah. after I use it. That was like, six after I use it. that written down. Oh, is that? Because I've had patients. Yeah, yeah. I, risk management called me yesterday because we had a patient that was, had to stay overnight because they had general and they didn't have a driver. Yeah. And they had someone safe at home. But like in the PACE instruction, she was like, you know, it doesn't say, it just says have a, a, a responsible adult at home. Uh -huh. It doesn't say someone needs to Did drive they show you. you the PACE instruction? I looked, I went into PACE, because she's like, where does it say that they have to have a driver? And I was like, I'm looking, and our pre-op calls, like they're supposed to be saying that. They but should. They just say, like the, the documentation adult, yeah. was just like done, done, done. It wasn't like specific. Uh -huh. So she's like, technically, like, she's like, I know from a general, you know, from anesthesia, Perspective, yeah, but mm -hmm. like we need to make sure. I don't know. I'll bring that back to them. Yeah, yeah, it we'll work on that. Make yeah. some education. Comes up all the time. Himself on like this morning, but he was taking narcotics all night long. So it's what, like um, two or four hours Six after hours you've received after um, medicine. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, if it's not general anesthesia, it's um, you know sedation. Um, sedation. It's six, Six hours. hours. To be honest, I, did, I knew it usually 24 hours, and I just recommend you take a narcotics not to drive, but I never knew those right. times. Right. right. Yeah. So there's no established policy. Okay. And we're working on that. Next. <laughs> it always work. Always work to improve. Yeah. Um, I've got a few questions if we want to go over. I think it's like five or six mm -hmm. uh, that we can talk. So um, this sort of just help us get, a, get an idea of what we have. Some of these I took from a, um, from a question bank. I think one of y'all's exams, and then a couple I made up, so maybe they work. A patient with previous well controlled diabetes scheduled for an add on case at the end of the day. Uh, got her humulin um, for blood glucose of 265. Uh, it's been NPO, did get an IV solution with dextrose, though, so fortunately. But what kind of anticipation or what kind of risk would you anticipate this patient to have in the perioperative? Hypoglycemia, mm -hmm. I agree, B, yep. Uh, a patient wishes to clarify that they uh, are DNR status before surgery. 
So we need to inform the patient that what's going to happen prior to going back. It's on hold and they're in the old. Yeah. No, right. no, no. D. It's D. So a discussion between the patient and physician needs to occur prior to any of that. Usually, yes, it is put on hold for the operating room or in the perioperative period. Mm -hmm. I and mean, we do have a policy here regarding that. Mm -hmm. But, um, yes, there is a discussion that would take place at mm -hmm. first. Uh, catnography during after sedation allows for continuous assessment of what? Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide. Material guard. Carbon dioxide. No, so catnography. A. Yeah. A is correct. Yeah. Abiola ventilation. Mm -hmm. So catnography is in tidal CO2 line. Mm -hmm. um, is what that is. So it is measuring carbon dioxide, but it's not measuring the arterial. Uh, let's see, an elderly patient arrives in the PACU following a GA uh, for a total hip. She awakes confused and attempting to reorient this patient. The perianesthesia nurse should do what? D. What is it? D. Is D is a dog. dog. Yes, provide <laughs> their sensory aids. Correct. I need my glasses too when I'm there. If not, I'm blind. <laughs> and then, which inhalational anesthetic agent would be most appropriate for a five year old male undergoing a circumcision? Nitrous. Or B. B, seroflurane. I would do seroflurane because I couldn't get full general anesthesia with nitrous. Now, oh. probably not the best For question because because I would, was a five-year-old kid. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I would probably use both actually, so mm -hmm. you could either answer would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably start with some nitrous, mm -hmm. then laughing, then <laughs> turn on the monkey gas. Mm -hmm. It would take a couple deep breaths and be full of general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So. B and C are good. This is my question, that's why I did it. Uh, <laughs> most of my answers have a couple. Um, a 61-year-old female is asked for an LAR uh, under GA. She's in the PACU, appears to be in respiratory distress, which would not be an appropriate uh, next action. <laughs> B. B. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Uh, and these two are uh, go together. So a young patient. Uh, she uh, this presents for dental rehabilitation over uh, we'll do it in, uh, in ACC for example uh, after induction we noticed a sharp rise in the patient's inside carbon dioxide and temperature so what is the appropriate diagnosis and treatment would you think yeah. dantrally yeah mm -hmm. so I'd say see malignant hyperthermia and dantrally just that reaction right a young kid Maybe didn't know, no one there in the family's had anesthesia before, any issues, mm -hmm. um, but then she has a reaction. Yes. Um, and so during this preoperative evaluation, her parents mentioned, oh, well, someone long ago had, had, had this reaction. Uh, so which medication should I avoid during this surgery? CZ. Okay, and which other one? Um, so C is the big one. D. D, D. Yeah. zebrafluorine, yeah. So good. So the answer B. So two of the above. B, C, and mm -hmm. D. Volatile anesthetics or inhalational. So seroflurane, desflurane, um, and isoflurane, and then keep it away from suctional colonies. So that's and that's why they would be trying to schedule them first thing in the morning. Excellent. Right. Yeah. So we would do try to schedule those kids if they have any issues first case in the morning, uh, and then so the night before we can clear our systems out. Mm -hmm. And I think now we have some filters that can clear it. Very, very swiftly. Mm -hmm. um, instead of blowing for 12, 14 hours, now we can do it within about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Type of filters we use. Awesome. Clears the system out. But otherwise, that was a pretty quick review. I guess we did about an hour. No, that was minutes. that was great. So, that was very thorough, um, helpful information. Thank you. That was really excellent. Um, what is your specialty? So right now, I'm going to go out in general anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't plan on doing a fellowship. I have mm -hmm. an interest in, in health policy and health administration as awesome. well. So I want to do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a prior degree? Uh, I just have a bachelor's, yeah. So I okay. didn't get an MBA yet, mm -hmm. uh, but I say yet because it's probably eventually in the mm -hmm. works. And when your bachelor's is in? Is it human nutrition, foods, and exercise? Awesome. So, uh, I, we have a lot of students that come in, so uh, I'm always, you know, the you know, just interested in what they went into before oh, yeah. because it's so varied. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I did, a, did exercise science. Was an athletic trainer. Thought I was going to do sports medicine and. And I uh, got into med school and liked uh, anesthesia a little bit. Got to know Dr. Butterworth and some of the guys mm -hmm. here and just led down that path. Awesome. Cool. So, yep. Well, All thank right. you so You're much. Welcome. You're welcome. Appreciate it.